Hi, my name is Mike, and I'm one of the pastors here at Kings Harbor. Thank you so much for joining us for this online message. Here's our hope that as you hear the word of God preached, that you would see Jesus more clearly and love him more deeply. And so over the next few moments, take notes, focus, and hear how the word of God is going to transform you. As you uh, take your seat, let me do a couple of things. One, allow me to reintroduce myself. Uh, my name's Mike. It's, seriously, if, you're a, if you've been a guest in the last four weeks or you're watching online and maybe it's your first time, uh, I'm one of the pastors here. My name is Mike, and I've been out on paternity leave, and so this is my first Sunday back. Uh, and so it's good to see you. <laughs> Family is doing well. Um, and so it's a grace from the Lord, and many of you have been kind in so many ways, and so thank you for that. Um, one of the things I want to do, though, is I'm going to quickly turn attention away from me and turn attention to Jesus and turn attention to what's happening in our world. Um, and so thinking about this morning, I, I want to just take some time and pray. So there's a few things that I think that are happening, uh, and, and, and in a weird way, they tie together, and they're not going to feel like it, uh, but I'll explain how they do in just a second. And so one of those things one, is that school is coming back. And if you're a student in the room, you're like, Bleh. if you're a parent in the room, you're like, glory. And so, like, I, I get it. And so, um, if you are a student or an educator or you work with students, uh, would you stand really quickly? Because I would love to pray for you. And so, if that's you and you're in the room, I want to I pray for you. Yeah, absolutely. Give them, a, give them a round of applause. You may be a coach, you, uh, you may be a principal, you know, if you're a principal, maybe don't stand up because kids are trying to avoid you, but you, you get it, you get it. Here's what I know. I think we are collectively more aware of our vulnerability than we've ever been before. And so stepping into a school year, like oh, when I was a kid, the thing I was most worried about is, is, is whatever I plan to wear on Monday going to look good. But now you guys have so many more challenges as students, so many more challenges as, as teachers. There's there are so many more challenges as educators that there is this sense of collective vulnerability that I just want to take a moment and pray for your protection. But I also want to pray that the Lord is not just sending you to get an education or give an education or be a part of extracurricular activity. But uh, Dr. Tony Evans would say it this way, that when you enter into a place that people see what an educator that's submitted fully to Christ, what that looks like. And when you enter in as a student, that people see what a student that's fully submitted to Christ looks like, and it shows them the goodness of God. And so I want to pray for your protection, but I also want to pray that you have your attention up and be on mission. And so let's pray together real quick. And if you're around one of these, would you lay a hand, stretch a hand? I want to, let's pray real quick. And so, um, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for these students. Uh, Shauna, when she started, said there, there's, a, there's a privilege in being together. Lord, there's a privilege that those who you've uh, allowed to be part of our family, those that are here in the room, those that are streaming from home or somewhere else, uh, the students that you've given us, that the, young, the younger generation that's going to stir our hearts and challenge us in things and show us things, Lord, thank you that you've given us them. And Lord, I pray for their protection. I pray that every moment that you, they walk on campus or, or maybe they're homeschooled or maybe some kind of hybrid between the two, that you're protecting them physically, that you're protecting them spiritually, that you're protecting them emotionally, that they feel your nearness to them as they enter into this school year. Last year at this moment, I talked about how this year, the, the school year feels like it's not what it ought to be. And we thought going into this school year that it was going to be more like what we were used to. And it feels like we're still not quite there. But Lord, I pray that that wouldn't dampen their opportunity to show the glory of God in their lives as they walk amongst other students. And Lord, I pray for educators, especially those in this room or those that are watching on the stream that trust you and love you. And, and because they may be in a public setting, they can't necessarily share their faith explicitly. But Lord, I pray that it would be just as Tim mentioned earlier, the aroma, that it would be the fragrance of everything that they do. Lord, I pray that you protect them. That there are difficulties in this day and age and entering into the public space as an educator. And so, Lord, would you protect them, those, whether they're in a, a private institution or whether they're in a public institution, whether it's from the little ones all the way up to college students, Lord, would you give them grace as they walk amongst those you've given them the, the opportunity to lead? So, Lord, I thank you for them. I thank you for uh, who they are and that you have set the boundaries of their dwellings and appointed them for this moment. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. And so the, I mentioned that we're more aware of our collective vulnerability than we've ever been. And I think one of the reasons that we're not 
hyper aware of how vulnerable we are as people is because we have the grace of living in the United States and there's uh, order. Uh, and one of the things that brings order is our government. Um, and I know there, it, ain't, it ain't perfect. But one of the things that gives uh, order is the, our law enforcement officers. And so as I was sitting at home during paternity leave, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but there was a officer in Chicago, her name was Ella French, that was just heinously murdered. And Chicago was grieving. And as I saw that, there's a couple, she's a, the, the mother of, I, I think, a two-month-old. And so just that reality that our officers who are trying to protect us are entering into danger and day after day after day, they're submitting their safety for the safety of us. And we're not as vulnerable as we could be because of the faithfulness of them. And so I just want to take a moment and pray for them. I'm going to pray for the city of Chicago as it grieves, but I also want to pray for our law enforcement officers here um, that they would be safe as they serve our city. And then I want to pray that they'd be encouraged because the last year and a half has been full of intense scrutiny. And even as, as the church, we've tried to live in this balance of being faithful when there's conversations about justice. But when you talk about this here, then it feels like you're against this here. And I said it a few weeks ago, and I'll just say it again. There's room for both. We can care about a biblical idea of justice, and we can love those who the Lord has given the grace and the authority to help meet that out. And so I just want to take a few moments. I'm not going to, if you're in law enforcement, I'm not going to have you stand because I think that's a security risk for you, so I'm not going to do that. But I just want to take a few moments, and I just want to pray over you. I just want to pray for you. And so church, if you would, uh, in, in the same way as you sit, and the Lord's not nervous, and so you can pray out loud, like the Lord doesn't need to hear me, he needs to hear us. And so for the next few moments, would you lift up the city of Chicago and the tension they're feeling right now? But would you also lift up Torrance PD, Redondo PD, all the surrounding PDs, uh, we can go Palos Verdes, we can go all the way up to Hawthorne, there's so many of them, LAPD. Like, would you just begin to lift them up and ask for the Lord to protect them and give them encouragement? Let's pray. And so Jesus, we come together and we lift our voices in this moment because something that's happened in our, in our society, in our nation, has brought awareness to us about how vulnerable we are again and that those that you've given the grace to protect us, that they are even more vulnerable. And so Lord, my heart grieves that this officer, this young mother, in, in faithfully doing her duties, was needlessly and foolishly killed. And so, Lord, would you bring justice? Would the person that committed what seems to be a crime, would, you, would they receive the measure of justice that their actions deserve? And then, Lord, would you help a grieving city and a grieving police department that for many of us, when her name falls out of the headlines, there's going to be a locker that's empty or a squad car that has a different person sitting in it. And, Lord, there's going to be people that are going to grieve for a long time. There's going to be a small child that will know of their, their, their parent through everybody else's eyes because somebody robbed them of having their parent in the flesh. And so, Lord, would you, would you help them in their grief? And then, Lord, would you move in power amongst the officers of this area. Lord, I'm, I'm thankful for uh, the men and women who are part of our congregation that serve as part of, uh, as part of law enforcement. Uh, there's a couple of guys that I know that recently just got uh, promoted to being able to uh, do training. And Lord, I'm thankful that you've put godly men in spaces where they're getting to train others, that they're getting to, just as Dr. Evans said, that this is what it looks like for an officer who's fully submitted to Jesus to operate in the public square. And so, Lord, would you protect them? Would you protect so many others, so many that are entering into difficult situations day after day? And then, Lord, would you encourage them? Lord, whether it be somebody dropping off cupcakes or whether it be somebody that sees them and instead of looking at them with the side eye and questioning their motives, looking at them and seeing them as people who are trying to serve the best they can and encouraging them, Lord, would that ever be on our lips? It's in your name I pray. Amen. And so I mentioned that part of the reason why we don't feel the level of vulnerability that we actually have is because we live in the United States. And we've probably become more aware about how difficult the world is in the last eight days than maybe any eight-day period that I can think of. 
Um, a year ago at this time, uh, we were out in the tent and uh, there, was a, there was an earthquake in Lebanon and we, we prayed about that. And a year later, the infrastructure of Lebanon still hasn't recovered. Or excuse me, it was an explosion, not an earthquake. And then just last Saturday night, and, and Tim prayed for this when we were in confession last week, like we, we, we recognized that there was a 7.2 earthquake on the Richter scale in Haiti, and we could pray for that. There's so many other things that are happening in our world that we could just spend this morning praying and we wouldn't scratch the surface of all the things that we're facing. But the one that's got everybody's attention is what's happening in Afghanistan. I can remember opening up my news feed and reading a friend of mine who is a mother of two and says that I've never had to worry about how do I get my kids to safety when there's nowhere that I can go. And so I just, I want to invite us to pray for two reasons. One, because the Lord hears us when we pray. And for the second reason, because I want us to lift our eyes up and to see more than what's just around us. We, we, we are people who the things that we care about, we pray about. If you care about your family, you care about your job, you pray about that thing. But I also believe that the things that you pray about, you'll learn to care about. And my hope is that the Lord would exalt our hearts to care about the nations the way that he does. And so I want to give you a few moments and maybe you can huddle up with those who you're with and pray. And so here's what I want to pray for uh, Afghanistan. Uh, I want to pray for the peace of Christ to be real for the Afghan people as they endure unrest, violence, and persecution. I want to pray for countries around the globe as they attempt to host the evacuated refugees. I want to pray for the Afghan believers who face the threat of death because they trust in Christ. I ask the Lord to grant them courage and wisdom. And I pray that the Lord would get glory out of this. That we'll look back and that was the start of something. I mean, I mean that's, not, that's not even fair. Something has been going on in the Middle East that, that the church is growing faster than anywhere else in the world. Something is already going on. And I preached this before, but I'll say it again. The kingdom of God ain't never taken an L. And I'm praying that we'll look back and we'll see this moment as just more evidence of that. And so I want to give you a few moments on the screens. You're going to see uh, those prayer points that I just listed. And I just want to give you an opportunity to pray. And then uh, with about a minute left, I'll bring us out and we'll, we'll jump into the word together.
Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that the book of Hebrews would say about you that you are a high priest that is touched by the, the feeling of our infirmity, that you sympathize with our weaknesses, that you became like us and you know what this is like. And that's not um, theoretical rhetoric that sounds good, but you, Jesus, were forced out of your home and had to run to Egypt like a refugee because of a terrible government. That you understood what it was like to not have the, the safety that we take for granted so often that it, you were under Roman rule and oppression and, and, like there was, and, and then you had a wicked king over Israel. Like all of that was your reality. And you feel what our Afghan brothers and sisters are feeling right now. You're not standing outside of it, away from it, hoping that they make it through, that you are in the midst amongst them. And Lord, I pray that uh, even for so many of them that may not know you, that Lord, that this is an opportunity that you draw glory by uh, those that are near to them that are suffering, but suffering differently because they know you, that, they, that this would be an opportunity for the gospel to be multiplied. Your kingdom's never lost. And so, Lord, would, would this be a moment that you draw glory for yourself? That, uh, Lord, I pray that uh, how, whatever way you choose to do it, that we'll look back and that this will not be as daunting and scary as it looks like in the moment, but instead that you're doing something far beyond what we can see. And we'll look back and we'll give you glory. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Yeah. If you've got a Bible, um, if you have a physical Bible, um, I always used to, I used to judge people in church that would have the physical Bible that would have like the multiple ribbons. I'm like, now you're just showing off. You gotta, you gotta find all the text this morning. If you're somebody that has multiple ribbons, today is your Sunday. Because <laughs> we're gonna be in Genesis 12 and Genesis 26 and Matthew 24 and whatever else I sneak in there. And so... If you've got a device, then you can just cheat and use the, the search function, and it's not as cool. But if you've got the multiple ribbons, this is going to be awesome for you. As we, as we get there, I, so I had a season in my life where every other week I was on an airplane. And some of you travel for a living. Some of you fly for a living. And so you're like, that's nothing. But for me, I, I didn't grow up flying places very often. And so that season of my life, I was in a church planting cohort. And every other week, we had to travel to, to be part of the cohort. And so I was constantly on airplanes. And then at the end of that time period, not only was, was I, did I do that, but I went to a mission trip in the Middle East and East Africa. And so I jumped on a bunch of planes. I was in five countries over like a period of 13 days. Like when I got back, like I didn't know where I was, what my name was, or why I was there. But of all those times flying in airplanes, I, I'm, I'm not a person that's afraid of flying. I'm not a person that, that flying makes me squeamish. Uh, but I recognize that there are people that are that way. And so one, trigger warning. What I'm about to share with you next, if you are afraid of flying, like skip the next three minutes if you're watching the stream, plug your ears and think happy thoughts till I'm done. Like I'll put my hands up and tell you that it's safe. But if you're scared of airplanes, like let me, like I'm going to tell a story. It might make you a little bit nervous. It's really not that bad, but it's kind of that bad. And so when I was, it, it, it does. So um, it's the law of non-contradiction. It can't be something and not be something. So, but it is. So, during that church planting cohort, we were flying, I was flying into Memphis. And you just have to know, like, I love Memphis. It's one of my favorite cities in the United States. <laughs> it's got, like, incredible barbecue. It's got unbelievable history. And it's got this kind of grit and glamour where, like, if you're walking down the street, it's like, man, that building's, oh, oh I wish they'd finished it. Like, that's just Memphis. And so we're, I'm excited. We're getting ready to fly in. And as we're getting to the airport, like we start feeling a little bit of turbulence. And at this point, I'd been flying so much that I'd learned a few things. And one of the things that you learn about flying is if you want to know how bad the turbulence is, watch the flight attendants. Like if the flight attendants are like just kind of moving and shaking and they don't care, then, then it's not a big deal. If they got, if they like, like motoring with that drink cart and they don't care if they break your elbow and they're like trying to get their seat and they're like extra seat belts, like they're, put, they're wrapping themselves in extenders, you know it's bad. 
And so we're feeling a bit of turbulence, and all of a sudden, the flight attendants, like, vanish. Like, they're not picking up people's trash. They don't care if you need a drink. Don't, don't mash the button. They ain't coming. But you can't trust the pilot. You can trust pilots, but in this situation, you can't, because they're going to stay calm. And so they come on, and they're like, we're just, we're just sparing a little, little bit of turbulence. Not that, nothing that serious. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to modulate the plane a little bit to, to deal with some of the wind of what's going on. Here's what that meant. A plane has two wings, and he's literally rolling from one side to the other to try and balance. And so people are like flying back and forth and like freaking out. Like I'm thinking about that movie where Denzel like flips the plane upside down and lands. And I'm like, if that happens, that's awesome. But Denzel was on drugs in the movie, so I don't want that to happen. <laughs> and then he comes on and he's like, well, here's what I'm doing. I'm trying to balance the, the lift from one wing to the other because if one wing gets overloaded, then we're going to go down. And if the other wing is not, be, not operational, then we're going to go down. So at this point, I'm like, I don't want to go to Memphis this bad. <laughs> and so I think about that because what he was telling us was that we, you needed to balance out, hey, it's safe. If you're, if you're scared of, of airplane stories, it's safe. What he was telling us was that airplanes operate because both wings balance things out. And as we've been walking in this series, a lot of what we've talked about with the prevailing church has been this kind of internal dynamic of what does it look like for us to be faithful in the midst of challenge and chaos. And I think that's one wing of a plane. But if that's all we were, then the plane doesn't fly. Uh, when I got hired on staff, one of the things that I, that I would say in elder meetings is like, it kind of feels like we're building a plane in the air. And so it feels like we got, we got a tail, tail to build, but somebody wants peanuts over here. We got to feel like, and so like there's this reality that for a plane to fly rightly, it's got to have both wings. And we've done well with the one wing internal. We've talked about that, but there's this external dynamic of what the Lord is doing and why the church has a mission that if we don't talk about that part of the plane, the plane don't fly. I can remember that there was a man and I, I, I was having a conversation with him and he asked me the question, is the church for the believer or is the church for the unbeliever? And if you've been around church circles, that, that's a conversation or maybe better said a hot debate about what the church is. But my argument is, why pick one? Because if it's like a plane, it actually needs both. And so let me, let me share a quote from a man named Jerry Bridges. He wrote in this book called The Discipline of Grace. He's actually talking about the way that we pursue holiness, but the, the visual that he gives is really helpful. And so he says this, visualize that, that aircraft as though you were looking down on it from above, as shown in the following illustration. So if you were looking in the book, you would see an illustration of, of, of a plane. It says, you see the fuselage, but that, that's the tube that you sit in. If you didn't know what that was called, I didn't, I had to like look it up. So I, it's okay. Where you're sitting, the two wings and the tail assembly. As you look at the two wings, you see the words dependence on the left wing and discipline on the right wing. The airplane illustrates one of the most important principles in the Christian life. Just as the airplane must have both wings to fly, so we must exercise both discipline and dependence in the pursuit of holiness. Just as it's impossible for an airplane to fly with only one wing, so it's impossible for us to successfully pursue holiness with only dependence or discipline. We absolutely must have both. And he says that to the individual, but I want to I want to expand that to the church as a whole. That if we're going to be what the Lord's called us to be, that we've got one wing that's that's our internal transformation, our internal growth, and our formation. But there's another wing over here that's about the mission, the proclamation of what God is doing. And if this wing is anemic, we don't fly. And so I'm just going to put you on full alert. We're talking about the nations this morning, and I'm coming with it. Let's pray. Jesus, help us to be fully formed. Help us to, to have what we need to be who you are calling us to be. That this one individual body can't just be about our own private formation, but there is this call for us to, to grow into a people that are willing to risk it all for you. And so help us be that. It's in your name I pray. Amen? Amen. Let me give you our main idea and table of contents before we jump into our three different texts. And so here's the main idea. Uh, the prevailing church is not a sedentary bunker to keep the Christian safe until the Lord returns. It is, a it is a dynamic vehicle that the Lord will use to reveal his unstoppable kingdom. 
So I, I want you to hear that. I've said it in other ways. I've said that the church is not a hospital. It's, a, it's an aircraft carrier. But I'll say it this way, that it's not this safety bunker to get in and avoid the rest of the world but instead that the church is this dynamic vehicle that the Lord said, hey, I'm revealing my kingdom in all places and you happen to be here as a believer in Jesus Christ, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, to be a part of what we're doing. That's why I love the plane analogy because nobody gets on a plane by accident. You get on a plane because you're agreeing to go somewhere. So let me flesh this out. I'll show you the initial call to this type of life in Genesis 12 verses one through three. And then I want you to see a repeated call in Genesis 26, verses 1 through 5. And then I want, to, I want you to see the timeless call that exists in Matthew 24, verses 13 and 14. So Genesis 12, starting in verse 1, would say this. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, I, I, I hate when I do this, but I do it to you all the time. When I drop you into the middle of a story or drop you in the middle of a text and you don't have any pretext. And so let me just take a couple of minutes to help you see what's already happened. Uh, Genesis chapter 11 is really important. And there, uh, it may not feel that way if you're doing your, Bible, your, your daily Bible reading because it's got one of those family tree genealogies that don't feel like they're important, but they actually really are. But just before that, there is this story of people gathering together and deciding, hey, we're gonna exalt ourselves up against God. And they begin to build a tower. And I love the text because there's some good biblical humor in there because they're like, we're gonna build a tower that gets to the heavens. And it says that God looks down from heaven. And he's like, what are they doing down there? Spirit, where's my glasses? I can't see what's going on. Let's go down there and figure out what's happening. So what felt impressive for them wasn't even notable to God. And but God said, but if I leave them to their own plan, they'll pull it off. And so they get scrambled into languages that ultimately moves into nations. And then we begin to see this story that now you've got this disjointed people that have exalted themselves against God. And so how does God get a people for himself? And so then you see this genealogy that begins to tell the story and zeroes in on the family of a man named Terah. And Terah had sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And as it begins to tell the story, what we think of is Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had Father Abraham. But at this point in the story, Father Abraham was living in Ur, which was this metropolitan city that was known for its multiplicity of gods. Abram's an idol worshiper. Uh, when you read the story of Abram, you read often that Abram has Lot, which is his nephew. And the reason that he had Lot, his nephew, is because his brother Haran died. And then not only did his brother Haran die, but shortly thereafter, his dad dies. And then when we jump into v chapter 12, verse 1, his father's just passed away. He's in the middle of this place of idol worshipers. And the Lord's first conversation with him is not, I know you're working through some things. The Lord's first conversation is, hey, I know it's hard right now because you're experiencing loss. The Lord's first conversation for him is, hey, leave. And, and, and then he defines it, leave your country. So leave the, the place where you've known. Leave your household. Leave your people. So not only is he experiencing this level of loss and, and this level of being surrounded by, by things that, aren't the, that isn't the God that's speaking to him, but now the God that's speaking to him is saying, hey, I know you're in the middle of some, some tragedy right now, but I'm inviting you to step into something. And then he says, and, and, and if you do it, here's what happens. I'll bless you. Now, now we got to be careful. Because we say this often that, that the scriptures can't mean for us what it didn't mean for them. And so when we read this, this is not the Lord saying, hey, I'm going to be your boy. And all of a sudden you're going to be hashtag blessed. Living your best life right now. Let me, let me, just, let me say something about that. Uh, if your best life is right now, it is a low budget paltry version of what the Lord actually has for you. And so if that's the game player, then like I got to get all the stuff. And I, like, like that's not what he means by blessing you. In fact, there, oftentimes when the Lord talks about blessing, it doesn't have anything to do with anything monetary. In fact, when you read over and over again in the scriptures about blessing, the conversations about blessing have more to do with his presence and his favor than it has to do with stuff. 
Which is why when you see the conversation about blessing, whether it's between God and man or man and man, that it doesn't matter whether you give me this stuff because my life is empty, Lord, if I don't have you. So this is why the, the grandson or the great-grandsons of Abram, one of them named Esau, would sell his birthright and then his dad would bless his brother and he would walk in and he would beg him, bless me too. It's not that I want stuff, it's that I want your favor, I want your presence, I want your attention. It's the reason that when, when Israel had been dancing around the golden calf and the Lord was like, you know what, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to kill y'all. I thought about it though. But you just go because if I go with you, I am going to end up killing y'all. It's, it's, that, it's that parent move. I'm going to need you to go time out right now because otherwise some bad things are going to happen. And Moses is like, no, 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 no. We're not going to go if you don't go with us. Because it's not a blessing to get to the land of milk and honey if the one that provides the milk and honey is not with us. It's the reason that before every time the priest would go in, that he would say, hey, the Lord bless you and keep you. They weren't walking into the holiest place and walking out with, with a, a bag full of money. They were going into the Lord's presence and they were pronouncing the blessing that they were going into. It's why Mary would say, hey, I feel blessed even though I'm this poor virgin girl that's on the outskirts of society, but you've turned my direction. I have your presence and your favor. And so this promise that he's making Yes, that he would bless him. Yes, that he would make his name great. Yes, that he would give him a land and a dynasty. And all those things feel impossible because if we read back a few verses, Abraham and Sarah are old and don't have kids and can't have kids. And yet the Lord is saying, because of my favor and my presence in your life, I am going to move in some ways, but they aren't blessings if they're not attached to me. And then he takes it one step further. He says, and then you're going to go be a blessing. That those who bless you, that they themselves will be blessed, that those that curse you. And so curse is the opposite. The first time you see curses talked about in the scripture is Genesis chapter 3, the saddest chapter in the entirety of the Bible. That Adam and Eve, uh, you, the Lord just starts cursing stuff. The Lord starts saying, hey, I'm cursing the serpent. You're going to crawl in your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I'm cursing childbirth. I'm cursing work. That it's lacking my favor and presence. That it's going to be a whole lot harder than what it used to be. But I also want you to notice that the Lord does the cursing, not us. So he doesn't say, you're going to go be a blessing. And those that bless you, I will bless them. And those that curse you, get them. So let me, let, me, let me bring it into our neighborhood. Genesis 12 isn't telling you that you can let that person know exactly what you think because they cut you off at Costco. He's saying that the, the, it's the Lord's work to deal with them. But then that, the end of that verse has this power because he says to him, and through you, all the nation, or if we looked at the word in the original language, it's all the peoples will be blessed. Wait, 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 wait. Didn't we just say that Genesis 11 started with there was this unified people that were exalting themselves against God, and in their attempt to exalt themselves against God, he spread them out into different peoples and different nations, and now the Lord has this plan through this person that's an idol worshiper that doesn't know him to try and bring those people back? That this early in the book, that God seems to have this plan that he's blessing somebody to know him, to walk in his presence, to have his favor. Not that they would have it for themselves, but that they would mediate that presence, that blessing, that goodness to people who don't know him. And that to go among them, however far or different they might be. This is the initial call of God. And then if you jump over to Genesis 26... It feels like he's just repeating the same thing, but he's saying it to a new generation. Genesis 26 and verse 1 would say this. Now there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your offspring, I will give all these lands. I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And I will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. 
So, so here what's happening. Let me connect the dots real quick. Isaac is the natural born son of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah, who couldn't have a child, the Lord blessed them and gave them a child. And then if you were to continue to read the text, when you get to Genesis 24, Abram dies. And in Genesis 25, we begin to hear about Isaac's family. And Isaac's boys are in this manipulative control battle. I mentioned it earlier that Jacob the younger convinces his older brother to give him the birthright so that way he can receive the direct blessing from his father. Or let me translate it. His kids are wiling out. And in the midst of that, there's a famine going on. And so now he's dealing with loss. The world around him's going crazy. He can't get his kids under control. And the Lord shows up and says, hey, I'm going to call you to the same thing I called your daddy to. Hey, in the middle of your struggle, in the middle of what feels like the world's falling apart, your, your climate isn't doing what it needs to do to produce food, your kids aren't being obedient, you've lost your dad who's the one that you were following after. In the middle of all that, I need you to also go and be a blessing to the nations. And, and let me say something, because I think it's important that the Lord would say that my call wasn't just for the ones that went before, but my call's for you also. Let me say it this way, that we as a church can't rest on the laurels of somebody else has done it, so we don't have to. Kings Harbor has a blessing. We've got people in the nations right now. We've got um, some workers in the Middle East. We've got some other workers that are training in uh, the United States to go and train those in the Middle East. We had a, a family that was in Mexico for nearly 20 years. We had others that were in another part of the Middle East. Like we have that blessing. And if we pat ourselves on the back, we said a generation before us went and we don't go, then we miss what Genesis 26 is about. That just because the one who got the original call wasn't there anymore doesn't mean that the call changed. So much so that the Lord would go to Isaac, his son, and say, hey, the same thing that I told your dad, I'm telling you, the same blessing that he had an opportunity to be a part of, you get to be a part of if you would do what he did and listen to my voice and obey the call. Okay, so maybe it's just that family. Maybe they like traveling. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the family business. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, uh, let me tell you two things. Matthew 24 is that chapter that you read when it feels like the world's going crazy and you're like, mm, that means Jesus is coming back. And so I was reading Matthew 24 because the world's going crazy. And the Lord started stirring something in me. So forgive me because I, I want to preach Matthew 24 and 25 in its entirety. And so as I was thinking, yeah, I was on paternity leave. I'm holding a newborn and like, play, like figuring stuff out on my phone. And so I was working on the preaching calendar for 2022. And so Lord willing, next summer we'll be in a series that's called Faithful and Wise over Matthew 24, 25, and Luke 14. So I'm excited about it, but I'll try not to preach it all right now. So I want to give you some context before we get to 13 and 14 and we see the timeless call. Matthew 24, starting in verse 1, would say this. Jesus left the temple and was going away. When his disciples came to, the, to point out to him the buildings of the temple, but he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And so just imagine, like a, just, just a little thought experiment. Imagine if you walked in, Shauna was welcoming you, and she, she talked about this morning hey, it's a privilege to be in here, not just because of the building. And then she was like, in fact, if you look at the stones in this building, there's not gonna be one stone still standing. You'd be like, okay, honey, get the kids. We go to another church. And that's just one particular building. But for that society, the, the temple was the place that the presence of God resided. And so for Jesus to make that statement, that the, the thing that is emblematic, that's the icon of your faith, is no longer going to be standing, that would be a moment of, uh, Jesus, you can't just throw that out there and not explain that. So verse 3 starts the explanation. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and in the end of the age. And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. 
And you'll hear, war, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed for this must take place, but it's not the end yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. It's almost as if we just needed Jesus to insert some things, that there's going to be wars and rumors of wars in the Middle East, that nations or even uh, difficult sects of, of radical governments within nations like Afghanistan are going to rise up, that there's going to be famines, that there's going to be uh, infrastructure damage in Lebanon that they can't recover from, that there's going to be earthquakes that measure 7.2 on the Richter scale in Haiti. And he would say, and all of these things are just the beginning. And so if, if I'm listening, I'm like, okay, Jesus, you got my attention. Where, where, where are we going with this? And then he would say this, and then they'll deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. So translation, hey, it, as you follow me, it's going to get harder. It's not going to just get harder because people are going to hate you. It's also going to get harder because people aren't going to want to listen to you. And so maybe Jesus was just kind of looking forward and say, hey, there's going to be this era that's coming that people are just going to want to deconstruct their faith. But there's going to be this moment that when you open up a conversation about Jesus, instead of them hearing goodness and kindness and mercy, they're going to hear hypocrisy, bigotry, and, and arrogance, and, and it's going to become really hard for you, and their love's going to grow cold. And then I also had to say, this has to be the worst recruiting speech ever. Like I have a friend and he's a football coach and so he, he recruits and I don't imagine that he's ever called somebody at home, sat in the living room and said, hey, if you would come to our program, here's what's going to happen for you. You're going to get beat up. You're going to get hated. Probably never going to play and maybe somebody kills you. Like nobody signs that scholarship offer. And this is what Jesus is saying to them. If you follow me, this is what's going to happen next. And so here's, that's all the buildup. And then verses 13 and 14 don't make sense fitting here, but here's what he says. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Like hear what Jesus is saying. Like, like it was bad for Abram. It was bad for Abraham because of his personal loss. It was bad for him because the world around him didn't know. It was bad for Isaac because of his personal loss, because it seemed like the world was going buck wild and it, his, he couldn't control his family. But you, if you follow me now, it's the same call with the same difficulty. And it doesn't seem to deter Jesus that if all this stuff falls apart, you're still called to proclaim me. And this is the timeless call of the Lord beyond ourselves to his heart for the nations. So what do we do with that? I said before that the prevailing church is not a sedentary bunker to keep Christians safe until the Lord returns. It is a dynamic vehicle the, the Lord will use to reveal his unstoppable kingdom. And I just gave you three different calls. I want to leave you with three obstacles we have to overcome. So here's the first obstacle, timing. Like, is this the right time to do this? Wouldn't it be more faithful to, to make sure that we're strong in the midst of all that we've gone through as a people, as a nation, as a church? Like, like that doesn't feel like it's wise. Interestingly enough, in the same text, Jesus would use those particular words. He would ask this question in, in Matthew 24, verse 30, 45. Who then is the faithful and the wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? And then Jesus would roll off four parables. The first parable that he would roll off is the, the picture of these two servants, the faithful servant who takes care of the house and the unfaithful, the wicked servant who doesn't take care of the house. Then he would tell this story about 10 virgins who are lighting their, who should light their lamps. And some of the virgins are ready and prepared. And he would say that this is the picture of faithfulness, that you're ready for the Lord's return and his call at any time it might come. Then the third parable is the story of those that are given talents by this landlord. He says, hey, I'm going to be back and I'm going to require something of you. I'll talk about that one in a second. And then the last one is the story about the sheeps and the wolves, that judgment. And you've guessed it. 
The ones that are the sheep are the ones that do something. The ones that are goats are the ones that knew a lot of information but didn't do anything with it. But that middle parable stirs me. Because this is not Jesus talking about Dave Ramsey envelopes and telling you where to put your money. This is Jesus saying to you that I've, I'm leaving and I've given you something. And are you going to hold on to it and play it safe and protect it? Or are you going to risk it all because I'm worthy? And so the question is, is it faithful and wise? Is this the right timing? Is this when we should do this? And Jesus would say, here's what faithful and wise looks like. You stay on ready and you're ready to risk it all. I have a friend who, uh, he works as a consultant with churches and he helps them to build their vision, their values. And, and he said, there's this church that it was the most unique value statement that he ever said. He said, they, their value statement is that they always keep their passports current. They're faithful because they stay ready. Man, I pray that we'd overcome this obstacle of, is it the right time? Is there too much going on? Like, I understand we can read Matthew 24. We can go back to the second week of the series and we can talk about the red rider and the pale rider and the black rider and all those things. But I'll just take you back to the end of Revelation 6. Who can stand? The people of God are the ones that can stand. And if that's the case, then that timing issue of what's faithful and wise, what's faithful and wise is to be ready and to risk it all. Let me keep going. Here's the second challenge or obstacle. Presuppositional lenses. I used to have a mentor and he was getting his doctorate and he had gone to study for a week and his professor used the phrase presuppositional lenses. And then I swear he just kind of squeezed it into every conversation that he could get it into. And so in honor of him, I used that today. Let me define what that is. It's this... Uh, this conclusion that you come to, even and you may not say it out loud, even before you have enough data to figure it out. Let me give you an example. School's coming. First day of school. Your teacher walks up. And before they say a word, you look at them and you're like, you're wearing dad jeans. You're not very cool. This class is going to be awful. So you've got these lenses by which you evaluate the world and you decide things are going to be this way before you have any data. Here's why I say that. I think when it comes to talking about the nations, here's our presuppositional lenses. You're not talking to me. You're talking to somebody else. You're, and so, so maybe it's, uh, uh, here's your presuppositional lens. Uh, you're not talking to me because I'm too old. I've at times been accused of only having a heart for young people. But I'll say this. I'm wearing the J's, and so I'm willing to start a fight. I'm waiting for the 70-year-old that'll come knock on my door and says, that nest is empty. I've got, I've got flexibility. Send me. I'm waiting for the person that says, I'm in this season of life where I've lived a lot of years and I want what I've got left to go for the glory of God amongst people who have not heard his name. Send me. So I don't have a heart for younger people or a heart for older people. I have a heart for missional people. And so I hope that you would hear that because we're talking about the nations, that you wouldn't say, because my integer is up above a certain number, that the Lord's not talking to me because the Lord was talking to you. Abram was 75 years old. And the Lord said, I'm sending you to go be a blessing to the nations. Here's the second one. Uh, you're not talking to me. I'm not in ministry. Do you know that at the time, Abram was a shepherd. In that society, being a shepherd was important, but it, it wasn't influential. When you fast forward even to the time of Jesus, that to be a shepherd meant that you couldn't give testimony in court because people didn't trust you. What job do you have today that people wouldn't let you give a testimony in court if you saw a crime? And that's where shepherds sat. That Abram didn't go to seminary. Abram didn't have strong theology. He grew up as an idol worshiper. And yet the Lord would say, you may not have all the prerequisites that we look for, and yet at the same time, I'm calling you. Or maybe you're saying, you're not talking to me because I haven't been a Christian long enough. 
we've already talked about that Abram didn't grow up in this. I mentioned earlier when we were praying that in the Middle East, the church is growing faster than it is anywhere else in the world. And part of what's happening is that believers are making disciples and telling them, hey, with what you know, you can, you can lead others. Like there's no probationary period. We got to do more and figure it out. Like you can be faithful. You have trusted Jesus. And if what Capenna preached last week is true, if you receive the word in power that the spirit of God resides in you, then regardless of the gap that you might have and experience, that the Lord can do something. And you may not be able to explain it all, but I'll also say this, nothing makes you want to get in the game than feeling, than feeling the challenge for real. Nothing makes you want to learn and study and pray and grow than sitting across the table from somebody that's saying, well, you said this about Jesus, but I don't believe it. I need you to explain that to me. And what if the Lord is saying, I know you hadn't been in this that long. Abram wasn't in it that long either. And I used him. Here's the third obstacle. Does the Lord really have our yes? So when I came to Jesus, the, the pastor that led me to that is like, he would always say, have you given Jesus your yes? And if you raised your hand, you prayed the prayer, you were saying, yeah, I've given you my yes. I can remember being a student. And one of the ways that they would kind of motivate us to think about where we stood with the Lord is they would say, on your way home tonight, if you happened to get into a car accident and died, where would you go? Which was super morbid. And you shouldn't do that to teenagers. but I'm actually more interested in a different question. What if today you leave here and you get in your car and you go safely home and you wake up tomorrow and you go to school or your job, where are you going to go? What, that if you wake up tomorrow and you're perfectly safe, does Jesus have your yes enough to put it wherever he wants to on a map? Does Jesus have your yes enough to say, hey, I'm sending you to a difficult place? If Jesus said, hey, you've been praying about Afghanistan this morning, so this week you're going to get some resources about how you can give and how you can learn more, and he begins to knock on the door of your heart and say, I want to send you there. Does he have your yes or does he have your, well, oh. Because what Jesus would say in another parable is that there's going to be a moment where he's going to be calling people and people are like, well, I just got married or I've got a field or I've got some oxen. And he'd say, okay, forget about them. I'll go find somebody else. Does Jesus have your yes? I've said this before and I'll say it again. How lame would the Great Commission be if it was come, play it safe, risk nothing, and live in your gated community. But instead, Jesus would say, I know it's bad. Go. I know it's insane out there. Go. I know that you may feel wrecked right now with what's happening to you personally. I know that you may feel terrified right now with what's happening in our world. And at the same time, the call hadn't changed. And this prevailing church is not meant to be a safe bunker for Christians to hide out. It's meant to be a dynamic vehicle that the Lord uses to reveal the kingdom. And if you go home and you're safe today, will you, where are you going to go? Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you see the call in all of its fullness, that you're not surprised by our world that 2,000 plus years before we ever stepped into the, this moment and into this week, you saw what we were going to enter into and you still said, and yet the gospel of the kingdom must be preached. Now would you give us the courage to preach it? Would you knock down the obstacles of this is the wrong time would you knock down the obstacles of 
I don't know enough or haven't been in this long enough or I'm not, I'm not in formal ministry. Lord, I, I, I know of people. I know of a young lady who left a, a, a wonderful job in Dallas to go clean houses for, uh, for, for indigenous people in the Middle East. Would you stir us in that way to say, whatever we got, we'll give. That the risk is right. That faithfulness looks like being ready. That wisdom looks like laying it on the line for the glory of your name. Would you help us to be a people who faithfully respond to the call? Send us to the nations. It's in your matchless name I pray. Amen. Again, thanks for watching this message online. And here's our hope, that you didn't just hear the word of God, but that it compels you to follow the way of Jesus. Here's what we mean by that. We're not just giving you information, but we believe that there's steps that you take afterwards to obey Jesus, to serve the world around you, to give sacrificially, and to go to others who haven't heard the message. And so one, we would love to know you, particularly if you're in the Southern California area. If you go to kingsharbor.org slash hello, you can send us a digital connect card and we would love to follow up with you, just get to know you better. But we also hope that you didn't just hear a message and then just stow it away somewhere, but it compels you to obey and follow the way of Jesus. Uh, we pray that you do that in community. That's the best way to live this out. You can live it out, we just don't believe you should live it out alone. Uh, on top of that, we, we believe that this is an opportunity to serve. And whether that's you serving uh, the church or the community around you, that those who follow Jesus reflect Jesus by the way that they serve. And then we would ask that you give. Giving is not something that is uh, just kind of a tradition in the church. It's evidence that you fully trust Jesus in every dimension of your life. And then finally, we're praying that you go that you would share this with someone else, that if the Lord has impacted you by his word to see Jesus better and love him more deeply, that you'd invite others to do the same by either sharing this message with them or entering into community with them and sharing what the Lord has done. So we're excited to hear from you, to connect with you, and to hear about what the Lord's doing through his word and in your life.